finalized that one yet. Okay, so um, hi everybody. We are here with our holistic practitioner series where we're going to help define the different possibilities in holistic healing today uh, through a modern perspective. So, you know, all the different options, different services. And we are here with the fabulous Jen Beck. And she is a registered nutrition consultant, but we are just actually starting the conversation today um, on kind of how Jen has come about with uh, figuring out how to define her herself and how in her position and her, and her many um, her many uh, tr clinical trainings and her many uh, uh, service based backgrounds that she can bring lots of expertise here. So stay tuned. We're going to talk about nutrition today as well as other things because uh, Jen does a whole lot more than that. <laughs> Jen, do you want to kind of keep going on what you were talking about and how you're searching for that, you know, niche that kind of that position that you're trying to give? Yeah, I mean, so for me, I, I have 20 years of experience and education in nutrition. So I was originally certified as a registered nutrition consultant, gosh, almost 20 years ago, and then have obviously continued my studies and doing a ton of self studies and research and things like that. Um, and then about three years ago, I added in an emotional healing modality called LIFT. And now I have an advanced certification in LIFT. And LIFT looks at the self limiting beliefs that we hold some of them have been inherited from our parents and programming we've received and influences from the society and things like that, um, as well as a lot of the trapped emotions that we store in our body that manifest physically. So I, I guess I, I always tell people that I help you figure out what you need to be eating and then also what's eating you so you can create lasting change, reclaim your health and your waistline. Yeah, I mean, we totally saw that with the five day sugar um, event that we did together that it was yeah. more than just eliminating the sugar, it was like tapping into the emotional reasons why we start eating sugar to begin with and how mm -hmm. we actually motivate the habit um, pretty, pretty intensely. Yeah. Yeah, it was it was fun to be able to see how many people um, just were able to finally make peace with sugar. Right? They not only got off of sugar and had the, the resources and the tools to do that and the knowledge to do it, but really being able to make peace with the cravings and the reasons why the cravings were there and come out on the other side, just feeling so much better and not feeling like they had to struggle with willpower and fight themselves or fight sugar every single day. Yeah, and it's great that you're you're offering coaching where, um, and I would love for you to go into that a little bit more, how you define coaching in your practice, because I think a lot of people still don't understand what it's like to work with a coach. Um, they're yeah. so used to the model of seeing a doctor and they give you this prescription, you go home, you take it, and that's the end. But rather, mm -hmm. you help up with individuals who participated in your experience, ask them how they were still doing, if they were still devoted to it as an encouraging way to keep them committed. So can you define the, how coaching works in your practice and kind of how? Yeah. Um, so coaching. So if you go to see a traditional dietitian in the medical model, they're going to hand you a meal plan and then say, go to it. We'll see you in another six weeks. And that's about it. Right. Um, and what happens is then people get overwhelmed. They get frustrated. They don't like the food. They don't know how to substitute. They don't know how to meal plan all of those things. So working with a coach is really helping you go instead of overhauling everything in one day or instead of following some rote plan, it really is looking at, okay, so what's your lifestyle like now? What are your goals? And then what are those baby steps that we need to take to facilitate that change? And I'm a huge believer, Laura, in layering success on top of success. You know, a lot of people, especially I think like New Year's resolutions, like this is you, I'm gonna get in shape. This is you, I'm gonna lose weight. I'm gonna go to the gym. I'm gonna cut out sugar, no more caffeine, no more alcohol, no more carbs. I'm gonna do this. And then it lasts about a week or two, if that. Because we try and change too much. So instead of doing that, it's just about those little baby steps. And one of the, one of the um, specialties I have is really being a problem solver. So I look at what the scenario is from that 30,000 foot view and look at, okay, so what are the things that are getting in the way? What are those, those roadblocks that somebody runs into and then they go, oh, I don't know what to do. So they default back, mm -hmm. right? I have a client who I'm working with right now and she's like, well, my husband's you know, birthday was this weekend and you know, we had people over and there's alcohol and there's sweets and there's this and there's that and the other. And um, and then she's working. And so we, we literally like 
okay, so here's the scenario. How are we going to work through that for your greatest success? It doesn't mean you can't enjoy some cake or, or a glass of wine or something like that, but it's really doing things intentionally, strategically for your best benefit, meaning that you feel amazing after you enjoy those things and you still get to have your health and your waistline and all of those things with it. Um, you know, and for me, it's really meeting somebody with where they're at. In my 20s, I lived on caffeine, sugar, fast food, and I smoked a half a pack of cigarettes a day. Yeah. <laughs> Which most people are shocked to hear. Yeah. So I know what it takes to go from living like that to living now, eating organically and, and cooking meals every day and, and really thriving. And so the last 20 years, I found all those little hacks to help people blast through that. So they can do in a matter of months what it took me years to do, but create lasting results. Yeah, I think I love that about your platform is that relatability. Um, when your daughter came on to your Zoom call, uh, you're alive and was like <laughs> talking about her experiences. And I think that you're finding a lot of power in that relatability because people mm -hmm. are really seeing that in that simple messaging that you are, in fact, you, you have that firsthand experience. And that in itself is a really powerful way to connect with people where they're at, like you said. And, um, and with that, I know when I was participating in the sugar challenge, because I wanted to do it too, um, yeah. struggle of this awareness, right, of all of a sudden becoming aware of how bad things have gotten with food <laughs> culture. And so yeah. do you find that some people struggle with that too, that when they become aware of how badly they've treated themselves, that like that in itself creates a resistance? It absolutely can. Yeah. And that's, that's a great point to bring up because I think sometimes we have this guilt, especially as moms. I mean, so many moms that I work with, they're like, oh my God, I had no idea what I was feeding my kids right. because we're just, we, you know, a lot of the things they have the same name as when we were kids, but we didn't have all of the junk and all the additives and preservatives and all the processing that we have in our foods today. So it, it is, it, it can be a real shock to the system um, because, you know, I was, it was funny, I was at the gas station this morning, paying for gas, and there's some guy checking out in front of me. He's got two bags of goldfish, two like, I don't know, breakfast bun type things, um, and then a couple of bottles of Gatorade, and it was like $8 for nothing but pure junk. And I'm thinking in my head, I'm like, well, he could have even just gone to like, you know, even a junk restaurant and got some eggs and, and, you know, something a little bit more nourishing. Um, but when we don't know what we don't know, it's, it can be challenging to make those transitions. So one of the things I'm, I'm a firm believer in is if you see it on TV, don't eat it. Um, that alone will give you some, some baseline, but you can't, you can't beat yourself up for what you don't know. Right. You can't you can't do anything about the past. So instead of lamenting about what you've done in the past or what you ate yesterday, even right. just focus on what you can do right now. And what's the next best step? How do you nourish your body in this moment and make a better choice going forward? Because when you that. know better, you can do better. I love that. And I love that um, that there's some of that emotional reason why um, to help people, but also like the really practical, like you know, 10, you know, if it's 10 ingredients or more, or if it's on TV, it, it, those are the kind right. of things people really like can really hit their head, like, you know, quickly. And they're like, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, like it just like stops their behavior in their tracks because, you know, that's what we need right now. We need something that pulls us out of that distraction mode and pulls us yeah. into, like, you know, better decision-making in the moment. Yeah. So for me, like I, if it has more than 10 ingredients, I don't really do it anymore. Like it just, it's, it's overwhelming and I feel pretty bad after I do it. So, and it's usually some alternative form of sugar. That's like really bad. And <laughs> messes <Right. with> <laughs> um, and then also like, you know, taking, what did you say earlier about what, you know, he, yeah, $8 on junk. So money yeah. is a tricky one. It's really tricky because sometimes we like think that we're making these best decisions and we're like, oh, so you probably hear this often, you know, but you know, oh, I can't do the organic diet. I can't afford it. What right. What do you say to that person? Well, so a big part of it is, is what you're eating organically, right? So if you're eating organic cookies versus regular cookies, yes, there's going to be a significant price difference because you're not getting high fructose corn syrup. You're not getting processed foods. You're not, you're getting better quality. 
But when it comes to eating whole foods, which is ideally what we want to do anyhow, there's really not that much of a difference between like organic berries and regular berries or organic lettuce and regular lettuce. And there's actually, there's a list of um, the dirty dozen, which are the 12 foods that you definitely want to buy organic, right? Things like celery and apples. Um, but then there's the clean 15, which have the least amount of pesticides and herbicides on them. You know, so it, depending on what you're eating, if you're eating whole foods, you're not going to be spending that much more on organics than you will natural. I think the difference is between, you know, 30 and 50 cents per pound, if we're talking about produce. Um, and at the same time, you know, the average American, they spend more money on the last two years of their life or two weeks of their life in medical costs than they do investing in their entire life when it comes to their health and being proactive. So for me personally, I look at it, it, it is an investment. I mean, my daughter and I's grocery bill is not small every month, but I look at the investment that we're making in our health and the quality of life that we have as a result of that, that alone is worth it because you're going to pay the money anyhow. I would rather pay it and feel amazing yeah. then pay it and be at the doctor's office and, and using whether they're over the counter prescription medications just to manage my health. Um, I'd rather just eat and thrive versus manage it. Yeah. And I do see that present in some of the messaging out there too, that it is um, about the lifelong process over yeah. the short term. Um, and even though when you said earlier, though, you know, you have this man in the gas station with his eight dollars, that eight dollars could have been spent elsewhere. So seeing those mm -hmm. dollar purchases too, like eight dollars yeah. here versus eight dollars here and really seeing the kind of acute reality um, because yeah. decisions seem to build up over time, too. For sure. So it's so just to that point, Laura, it was really interesting. So I was I, I was at a um, conference last weekend and I was speaking and one of the guys that was in the audience sent me a video a couple days later and he you know did a Facebook live and he's like, all right, so normally, uh, so I forgot my lunch today, normally I would be at Sonic and I would spend 10, $15 for lunch at Sonic. I get like a double cheeseburger, a double bacon cheeseburger and fries and maybe a Reese's glass and so on and so forth. He goes, but you know what? I listened to Jen Beck this weekend and here's what I did instead. So he grabs his grocery bag. He's got a whole rotisserie chicken. He's got an, a container of mixed veggies like um, carrots and snap peas and, and broccoli. And he's like, I don't do the cherry tomatoes. Those will probably go by the wayside, but the rest of it I'll eat. And he had an avocado and um, I think some hummus or something like that, or some Swiss cheese. Right. And he goes, I spent about 18 or 20 bucks on this, but this will last me for two or three days right. versus the one meal at Sonic. So yeah. I think that's kind of what we're talking about. Right. So just diverting our spending patterns, we can get more health and more food when we look at how we're eating and what we're eating and the quality. Um, so we get the best of both worlds doing it that way. Yes. Good. So just it kind of what I'm hearing is that kind of um, the I can't do this is a resistance we're putting up kind of yeah. because we still prefer this other food. And I know with fast food, the, the prices have gone up actually. Um, yeah. so really, what are we doing? Are we just going really, what are we feeding us? Like we're intentionally spending more money. So yeah, moving on from that, we already know that being healthier is actually probably a lot, in fact, is more cost um, effective and we're not we're not poisoning ourselves over time. So right. causing harm. And something I saw was that a lot of our diet is like fat. Um, so protein, fat. Um, what would you say the general American diet is today? <laughs> Consuming food-like substances. Like most Americans don't eat real food on a, on a daily basis on the average, right? Um, I, for me, I, I believe and I teach that we need protein, fiber, and fat on a daily basis. Um, and, but it has to be in the right balance for what your body needs, Laura, what my body needs, what Sam's body needs, what Paula's body needs, because we're all different, right? So if we all go, I'm going to go do keto, or I'm going to go do high carb, low fat, we're going to end up in a world of hurt because we're not eating what our body needs specifically, and that's part of what I help people figure out is what their metabolic design is, how much protein, fiber, and fat they need, and then which of the foods in those categories are their best fuel and which ones are going to slow them down. Because one man's nutrition is another man's poison. 
and vice versa. That's great. Yeah, and then how you know would you approach people with? I think there's a lot of hypersensitivity now in diets and mm -hmm. and just a lot of chronic illness coming about that probably had to do with food and just yeah. How do you how do you approach that? Yeah, and again, it, it goes back to what are we eating, right? Um, and there's really two factors that that I think are creating a lot of the autoimmune issues and a lot of the the health issues that we have now. Part of it is eating the processed foods, and the other part of it's stress. Right, our country, our, our world right now with the pandemic and everything else is under crazy amounts of stress with just the uncertainty and insecurity. But if you look at the average person, we're working harder and longer hours and now we've got other stressors in there as well. But that stress decreases our, our gut health, right? I mean, it literally impacts us on a daily basis. And the more that our, our gut lining breaks down, the more we create leaky gut, the more we have whole food particles passing through our, our um, GI lining into our bloodstream. And then our body sends out antibodies and attacks it. Yeah. And yeah. we eat stuff that creates that permeability with gluten and dairy and a lot of the processed foods that we're eating. Yeah, so I think if, sorry, go not ahead. To, not to mention nutrient absorption is diminished. So right. If you are then supplementing the foods, then the right foods, your body not necessarily is processing that correctly. So yeah, great. Absolutely. Um, so through the food, through getting to know our, our own unique metabolic health, um, getting to know um, what it is that we need to have more on our plate and thinking more strategically so that we um, save money and don't go for the bad choices because of past behavior or by emotional reason. Well, that's pretty comprehensive. So, <laughs> uh, so why don't you, um, let's go back to the theme of this whole series, which is, you know, what sets your role apart from others? Like what are the other roles that potentially are out there in the field of nutrition? So there's, there's a lot of different, um, there's a lot of different focuses now. Um, I would say there's functional medicine, there's, you know, more the, the strict dietary. Um, there's some people that really focus on um, macros, right? And let's count everything. There's the intuitive eaters, there's the micromanagers. And for me personally, again, it, it goes back with meeting somebody where they're at. Because if you try and set somebody up that is not detail oriented, and you want them to track and measure every ounce, every gram that goes into their mouth, it's going to be really challenging for them to be successful with that long term. Now, somebody that's a total type A thrives on that, right? And they're like, awesome, I get to count and micromanage everything. Sweet, I can totally do that. So it really is finding the, the right way, the right program for somebody specifically based on what their needs are. Um, for me, I set, the thing that sets me apart is really looking at that holistic picture, but then really incorporating the mindset and the emotional healing component with it. You know, for somebody that's, losing, that's trying to lose weight, there's a dozen reasons why we hold on to excess fat. One of those, um, one of the many is, is an emotional reason where our body is literally wrapping us in fat as protection. And I find this a lot with women that have had any kind of, especially um, sexual trauma, but any kind of abuse, emotional or physical, that their body just naturally wants to wrap them in fat because it, it helps them feel protected, but it also subconsciously is, is that makes them blend in more. They don't stand out more. And so it's really looking at what are those underlying things. I think it's super specific and it's great to hear all the other routes, what could be possible for other people. So have you, um, would your position work in a clinical setting and, you know, uh, but what type or what type of setting do you now work in? Like seeing the evolution of where, where people like you would be. Yeah, I would say that um, I partner with the doctor, uh, but I am probably not the clinical setting type of person because in a clinical setting, they typically have 15 to 20 minutes and they are turning and burning all throughout the day. And I really like part of my passion is helping people to figure out where they need to go and what's next that's right for them. And you can't do that in a short amount of time. So for me, I work virtually with people now. I had a physical location up until COVID. My daughter's school closed for three months and I went, well, I guess we'll switch to online now. Mm -hmm. And my clients have really, really enjoyed that and love not having to drive anywhere. And it's allowed me to help people worldwide, um, which is very exciting. 
So all my work is done one on one, or one on one is done now through Zoom. And then I also have some group programs and things like that um, that I offer as well. But it's it's all done virtually, so people can access it wherever they are. Awesome and perfect. So, um, so that was a recent change in your business structure, then. Mm-hmm. Yeah, about a year and a half ago now. Um, so it's it's fairly recent, but it's been it's worked out very well. That's great. That's great. Um, all right. So, yeah. What else do you want to go into when it comes to you know how you became how you decided to become this role? Um, yeah. Um, so I actually got started in nutrition. I told you that I, I did not live healthy when I was in my twenties. Um, I got started in nutrition because of my mom's health. So she had multiple sclerosis my entire life. And, um, she was 49 years old and she had a series of relapses where she went from living on her own to being in a nursing home in six weeks. And she was on all the preventative medications to make sure that that very thing didn't happen. And so at that point, I was like, well, obviously the medications aren't working. So something has to help her. And I started diving into um, alternative medicine, trying to find other ways that would be able to support her. And um, during my research, I ended up at a conference being taught by a pharmacist. And he was talking about the healing benefits of superfoods, which I thought was ironic that a pharmacist was talking about food. Mm -hmm. Um, But afterwards, throughout his talk, he was talking about his wife who had had MS for 26 years, just like my mom. And I saw the two of them walking across the ballroom after his talk. And I I was just floored. I mean, she really had nothing wrong with her, maybe holding his arm for stability. And that was about it. My mom had been walking with a cane since I was like four or five. And I got a chance to meet her afterwards. And I said, you know, what drugs are you on? And she's like, hi, my name is Dr. (laughs) Mrs. Susser. And because I was just, I mean, I was so floored. And um, I said, you know, what medications are you on? She goes, well, I'm not on any medications. My husband didn't believe in them. Your husband, the pharmacist, didn't believe in the meds. And she said, no, because the side effects were too great and the population studies were too small and too short. So I just built my body up with diet, supplements, and exercise. And I just remember standing there dumbfounded, like thinking about my mom's lifestyle. Um, I don't think I ever saw her work out. Maybe she did some physical therapy if she you know, had a, a small relapse or something like that earlier on. Um, she took supplements for like six months when I was in sixth grade and said, ah, they don't work. I'm not doing it. They're too expensive. And we ate balanced meals as kids. Like it was a can of green beans, a can of cream corn, instant potatoes, and Salisbury steak out of the freezer, right? So (laughs) balanced, two veggies, a starch, and a protein, just not necessarily nutritionally dense. And so that got me thinking about really the, the role of nutrition in our health. So I just dove into research. And the more research I did, the more I saw people reversing MS and heart disease and cancer and diabetes and you know, every, every disease that I thought was a life sentence, once you got that diagnosis, people were, rever- were reversing it. So that's yeah. why I went back to school and got a certification in nutrition. Um, a little bit of a detour from marketing communications, mm-hmm. um, but it's, it's been amazing working for the last 20 years to be able to help people reclaim their health and reclaim their waistline and feel amazing again. Um, with my mom, we were able to to really have a significant impact on her quality of life. Um, At the nursing home, she was having a urinary tract infection like every other month. Mm -hmm. And when I got her into a group home and actually started impacting her nutrition and her diet and stuff like that, they went from every other month to every other year or two. Um, Her cognition improved and her her nurses and aides said that we easily extended her life and improved the quality of her life by five to 10 years. Did you guys take out the sugar? Was there, because I mean, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, I can't say we took out all of it. When she was at the nursing home, she literally was eating a bowl of yogurt, like sugar yogurt, two or three times a day. Like, (laughs) <laughs> or, or that the little packets of oatmeal, you know, the maple syrup, maple syrup and brown sugar ones. Um, so she just didn't have quality of nutrition. And so by changing that diet and then adding in a couple of supplements, we had tremendous results for her. Uh, yeah. But yeah, sugar is a big one to take out. Yeah, it's well known in Chinese medicine to use diet, to use meals as a method of, of the therapeutic, you know, mm-hmm and evaluating from certain patterns of tongue and skin and other things to assess what diet is best. And so the value of 
of that and taking care of our elderly and our children and anybody who's relying on um, other people to care for them. It's really kind of important. Um, mm-hmm. So great. Yeah. Um, what, a, what a great journey. And so you had some background, but also then it was this talk. Well, who is this? Uh, so this pharmacist. I mean, that's so interesting. Yeah. So his name is Dr. Arnold Suster. Um, and so he's somebody that just got into nutrition and he wrote, um, he wrote a book about, and I'm struggling for the name of it right now. Um, but it's, it's all the, it's about all the healing foods that were found in the Bible. Things like, you know, sweet almond and wheatgrass and olive leaf and, you know, grapes and pomegranates and, and, um, all the different healing foods that are in there and those superfoods that, You know, I mean, the average American doesn't eat, unfortunately. You know, the average person doesn't, like, less than 9% of the population eats a dark leafy green on a daily basis. Ooh, that's terrible. Kale is so so healthy. It's so good. Right. idea in my head, because I know in herbalism and holistic circles, I see certain things. I'm like, that's not true. Uh, what, What kinds of things pop up in nutrition for you as being like, well, that's just inflated and not evidence-based or, you know, so much, (laughs) there's, there's so much. Well, because if you think about nutrition is the only science that can have opposing theories and both of them are backed by research, right? So milk is good for you. Oh wait, nope. Milk is bad for you. Mm -hmm. Oh, eat eggs. Nope. Don't eat eggs. They're high in cholesterol, right? I think the only one that there is, well, there's even, there's even debate about sugar, right? Is, is natural sugar healthy for you versus processed sugar? It's healthier, but depending on what your health condition is, Mm. may not still be good for you. Right. So it's really, it comes down to the individual. So all of these blanket um, programs or diets and stuff like that, uh, there, we could go on for days about that, right? The whole, oh, just work out more than you eat and you'll be fine. It's like, no. (laughs) It's problematic. I see that with probiotics, probiotic everything, but you know what is the gut going through and is it just a band-aid on the wound of a right a yeah of- or like you have you have commercials like activia where it says you know get the servings that you know get the probiotics that you need for a healthy gut well fine print they say eat three servings of their yogurt a day mm. to get the baseline probiotics but they don't mention anything about like the 19 grams of sugar in there Ugh. which is completely counterproductive I mean, eating, there's no reason anybody should be consuming 50, 60 grams of sugar just from yogurt alone a day, let alone that much, period. Yeah. What we're seeing now is a lot of people, if they come into our view, they really want, they want to know that they're in a place where they can go through a trustworthy relationship and go through this process. Um, Do you agree with that? I mean, that's completely, completely, it's very distracting and. Just yeah. Understand. And, you know, and, and I don't fault our doctors by any stretch of the imagination. They are taught in schools that are funded by pharmaceuticals. But there is no money in cures, right? There is money in managing a, a disease with a dollar a day a pill, or some of these are like $2,000 a month, which is crazy. But they're doing the best that they can, and they're stressed out, they're overwhelmed, they're overworked. And they're not taught how to heal the body. Uh, my ex-husband was having some heart palpitations and stuff like that. And we went to see his cardiologist in the heart failure clinic. And his cardiologist said, I'm going to defer to your wife on the nutrition because she knows more than I do. Right? The average doctor has one class in nutrition and it's an elective. Now, there are more and more functional medicine doctors, which is great. But even that is still not the norm yet. And until we really start taking a functional approach, it's gonna be a long time before we really heal our world. So part of it is really becoming an advocate and listening to your body, right? After you eat, check in with how you feel an hour or two later, right? Do you have good energy? Do you have any digestive issues? Are you tired? Are you hungry? Do you have cravings or brain fog? Like really listen to your body. Headaches. Headaches, right? (laughs) You know, if there's, if there's anything that's a nuance off, write down what you ate and then keep track. And every time you eat, if there's something a little bit off, write down what you ate. But remember also that, and I always have people journal like for one to three, one to four weeks, like for a week to a month. 
and really look at what the patterns are. Um, because if you only write down what you just ate, you might be missing the boat because food sensitivities can show up 30 minutes to three days later. So it's so key to really look at how you're feeling throughout the course of the day, not the number on the scale, not the number on the labs, because those are big boulders, but to really understand your body, it's important that you listen to it on a consistent basis. Awesome, awesome problem solving here with Ms. Jen Beck. Um, so thank you so much. And um, how can, you know, actually let me stop the video now and then we'll pop up into how people can work with you. Okay.